Welcome back to the Short Coat Podcast, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Etler, uh, but that's not important right now. On today's show, bring back the woolly mammoth. A Texas hospital wants med students to fill in during their nursing crisis, and we'll wash it all down with a steaming mug of delicious betadine. Uh, with me today in the studio and live streaming on the Short Coat Student Lounge on Facebook, it's MD PhD student Riley Bean. Hello. We've got uh, MD PhD student Miranda Skeen. What's up? We've got M2 Sarah Costello. Hello, lovely people. And then mm-hmm. there's MD PhD student Aline Sanduk. Hey guys. <laughs> Anybody so, uh, audio medium, Aline, you can't just wave. <laughs> Double handed. I realized that that's why there's a 20 second delay in my hello. <laughs> <laughs> And if you thought that was all, listeners, well, you're wrong, because we have a listener question, and uh, I invited the listener to be on the show. Br- Brenna reached out to the shortcoats at gmail.com with her question, and uh, hello, Brenna. Hi, everyone. Don't mute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> don't mute yourself. We don't mute ourselves. You can't mute yourself. Okay. We never mute ourselves. That's what we, ha- that's what we have an editor for. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Brenna, tell us about yourself. Well... I grew up in Connecticut, and I have three sisters, went to college after I graduated from high school, and then took a sharp left turn, and I started working in the outdoor industry, so I was leading uh, hiking, sea kayaking, whitewater rafting, and backcountry skiing trips, so I did that for six years and traveled a bunch, got to see a lot of cool places, and while I was doing that... um, since I had sometimes participants get hurt or sick, then I realized that medicine um, might be a good path for me. So I started looking into that, got my EMT, and I've been uh, pursuing that fully, taking post back classes for the last uh, year and a little bit. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. I live in Silver City, New Mexico, which is like way southwest. Oh, that sounds and, that sounds like a cool. Yeah, I'm engaged. Uh, That's about it. Hey, there you hey, go. Congratulations. Congratulations. Um, you. so uh, you know, you reached out to us. Uh, what is it that? Uh, how how can we help you? My question is a, a two parter. So the first part is about uh, making a school list and choosing where to apply as a non traditional student, and if there's any like indicators that um, you all notice either just like on school websites or during the interview process that seem to indicate that a school would be a better fit for you. Um, And then the second part is now that you're in school, um, like what's the social experience like as an older student? All right. Those are great questions. Um, So let's start out with uh, finding non-trad friendly schools. Um. I guess the first thing we need to do is talk about what you mean by non non trad friendly. Do you mean that they just admit non trads, or is there more to that question? Um, that's a good question. Maybe that's where I start. Well, yeah. What does it mean to be non friendly? Non trad friendly? Is that even a thing? Um, and I guess um, I think that there's maybe some variation in terms of um like average age of matriculants at schools. And so maybe that's an indicator. Um, but I don't know if there's other ones that people can think of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, originally asked that question because it occurred to me that there's all kinds of different non-tra- non-traditional students. There's career changers. There's people with, uh, with uh, families, um, uh, you know, even just people who took gap years, you know, talk about themselves as, as being non-traditional. And so all those are worth, uh, you know, sort of, looking at. I think for you, what do you guys think? I think for you, I would sit down and start, you know, thinking about the things that I need as a non-traditional student. Oh, are we allowed to, to talk now, Dave? I was oh, sure if you just wanted to just, chat with a listener just all by talk. yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Uh, what, what do you, uh, what do you... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, what do you what this do you is, think this about is why this we question? We don't invite listeners to do the you, podcast because they just see how flimsy we are. Yeah. Before it. <laughs> <laughs> do you guys think? As I guess my experience as a non trad, looking for a 
um, a school was was different to how um, Brenna's experience is going to be because I was very limited. I had to find schools that would let let in people with international degrees. So I guess maybe you guys are more like I wondered how different the process is looking for schools if you're a non trad in in Brenna's situation who has a post um, post back compared to just the um, traditional student. I do think, and again, so kind of coming from my background, I did come kind of straight out of undergrad, but I did have a career change within undergrad, started off with um, an engineering degree, really thought I was going down that path, worked for some companies. And so I did kind of have that non-traditional essence of coming from a career change. And a lot of my application showed that I hadn't done a lot of medicine, but I had done a lot of this like other career. Um, And so I think for me, it was important to just like find schools, first of all, that kind of aligned with what I wanted to be as a medical student. And so for me, that included maybe um, an engineering program. And so that was really great for me. And so for you, it might be an emphasis on wilderness medicine or somewhere that is really close to outdoor facilities. If you see that as kind of what you want to carry from your like previous life into what you want to do in medicine. So I think kind of a great starting point for you that I used, which is looking at what I've done and like how that can get me to where I want to be and finding schools that like really value that. I think schools in Colorado might really value a um, wilderness medicine experience, whereas I don't know, schools in Boston, Boston, Boston. or New York City, they might not, they don't know trees. Like they just don't know. (laughs) They won't know what to ask. And so I think um, kind of some self-reflection there could be a really good starting place and then going to look at do these schools like to see non-traditional students um, as well. Yeah. Morning. Oh, Sorry. I was going to say, I've just generally seen a rise in non-traditional students, especially if you could just consider students with gap years to be non-traditional, although I have a feeling that definition might get redefined in the future because what with medical schools becoming like like basically the bar being raised people coming in with more experience between undergrad and medical school almost have an advantage Mm -hmm. and especially if they can frame that in terms of like like for example you you're you know medicine experience actually relate to this that was one of the ways I wanted to get into medicine was uh I started being like the medic for our backpacking trip and that was how I found out I liked it um, so if you can frame that as like, that is part of an important part of your journey and how you decided to come into medicine, then that is going to be something that schools are going to be interested in because it's like, oh, she's actually like, she didn't think she was, but now that she's had this experience, it's becoming, I've gotten off track, but basically schools are starting to look more for those kinds of things and not just like, did you get A's? How old did you do on your MCAT? Like people are looking for people with rich backgrounds that, and I'm very encouraged to see that shift in medical school culture. Yeah, and a lot of the questions that are coming up are really like related to to diversity and giving you a chance to sell, tell your story and stuff. So, like it's kind of um, it's kind of cool when you're filling out the applications and you do have all these stories to tell because you've got so much more more life experience and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I would say in regards to finding those schools that really value that. That's a trickier question because schools are not often going to just say that they truly are non-traditional friendly Mm -hmm. because in reality, most schools are going to say they would love non-traditional students. So I do think looking at maybe the average age of matriculants, you could even reach out and ask the school if they could connect you with a non-traditional student at that school who may be able to give you more insight into how their experience at the school has been. I think what I've learned over my not many years of life on this earth, but I'm learning it is that it's easier to connect to people than just to read a web page of information. Like people give so much more knowledge. That's why this podcast is great as opposed to just looking up Carver College of Medicine. So that would maybe be my advice is to look for things on the website and then like ask to be connected to students that would give you better insight into that school. And can I ask a question about that? Yes. Yeah. Um, is that common? Did, did any of you do that? Reach out and get connected with a current medical student? So I had through the school that I was at in undergrad, I had reached out through my academic advisor asking for students who were in MD PhD programs, kind of the path that I saw myself going. And I had an incredible mentor of a student who it wasn't that we talked a whole lot, but she gave me a wealth of knowledge in like one or two phone calls. And I think a large majority of medical students in some way want to be able to mentor other students. And I don't like that word mentor because it like kind of 
adds a power differential. It's almost like a peer to peer, just like a, I, somebody helped me along the way. So I want to help someone else. Yeah, peer, peer mentoring is. The yeah. Thing. Peer mentoring. Mm-hmm. And so I think I used it in maybe not the same, to the same degree that I'm kind of asking or encouraging you to use it, but I think it's a really valuable tool mm-hmm. to have personal connection. Yeah. And while I'm not sure how well you'd be able to do that when you're in the first step of just like making a list of schools to apply to, once you're in the face of like looking at interviews or looking at even secondaries, then reaching out to the schools and saying like, hey, as part of the interview, could I possibly talk to a student? That is something that they're almost certainly going to want to accommodate because that Mm -hmm. even during interview season and especially revisit, they're trying to sell you on the school so they can connect you and they're trying to find out if you're a good fit. So that is going to be a point where schools are going to be very receptive to request to like, like, I think I've even gotten emails that are like, you know, hey, we got a student that wants to talk to the person who does paper mache. I don't know. But like, <laughs> paper mache. I don't do paper mache. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> but yeah, that is definitely something that schools can be more receptive to. At the early stages, um, I personally, a lot of schools, and you all can disagree with me on this, but when I was doing school hunting, I found that schools will sometimes list like things like ways to be successful or ways. If that page is very heavily academic focused, like ways to be successful, Mm. it's like get good grades, get good test scores. That might be a phrase to being like, yeah, maybe they're not so friendly to more diverse backgrounds. But if things are like, you know, get a wide range of experiences or like we want to hear about X, Y, Z, that could be something to look for. And just do they have an extreme focus on academics or do they have a major focus on your story and how you are? What are you going to bring to the school? Yeah. I think you can reach out to schools earlier than what you were saying, uh, yeah. Miranda. I, th- I oh, think you, I you, think schools you'd absolutely will be, reach out to schools yeah. earlier. But sometimes, like when you're ta- asking about like talking to specific students about specific things, that involves more work on the schools end. Was all I was thinking. Um, I looked at uh, our admissions page today, and you know we do have a class profile on our website. Um, I don't know that other schools do that but maybe they do um and i see that our age range for the class of 21 is 20 to 35 we have 13 who are 26 and older and three who are 30 and older um i don't know what conclusion you can draw i don't i mean we are i can say non-traditional friendly in the sense that we love non-trads we love the depth of experience they bring we love the um the the attitude that they usually bring um, to, to studying medicine. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of important to us, but I don't know if you can look into the absolute number and go like, Oh, um, if they have 20% non-traditional students, then, then I'm happy with that because I don't think it's not as common. Yeah. Um, for people who are, you know, your age, Brenna to, um, to apply to medical school. That said, it's awesome. And, and I, I think that any school would be happy to have somebody who has um, the kind of experience you have in the, in the, and the uh, trajectory that you followed so far. I have one last piece of advice, and this is coming from the fact that you mentioned that you are engaged. I think um, for maybe a non-traditional student, it would be a really important thing to maybe look at where your school is. Where can your partner kind of pursue their life goals as well? That's not something that somebody coming Um, as a 20 year old out of college might have the same experience to have. So that could maybe be another aspect of your search for non-traditional schools that is really vital in making sure that your partner feels like a valuable member of the searching process. I know when I was looking for schools, my fiance really appreciated that I like included him in that decision making. So just yet another something to think about. And you might have kind of some experiences that as well. Yeah, i not really, because I wanted to. <laughs> yeah, I, no. I wanted to go to Iowa, and um, and I applied to a few other schools, but Iowa was the only school I got an interview for, and I got in. So yeah. I, I guess, <laughs> and so yeah, I guess we did I think that, about that, but we sort of just had our fingers crossed that it would be Iowa because he was he had a job here already. So. I think that yeah, I think the hard part about you know this giving this sort of advice is that for many people, you know you. You, you, you're most people probably aren't, you know, being fought over by schools. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think that's just, you know, 
Yeah. It's just not common for for that to be the case. And so, you know, you go where you can you can go. Yeah. Um, People always ask me, like, especially we just had an interview. It's like, why did you choose Iowa? And I have a response for that. Well, it's like the community is great and I felt like I would be very successful here. And in the back of my mind, the, my little mind grumbling just was like, but also nobody wanted you. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that's not true. Your grum- I, your mind gremlin is wrong. Yeah, but that's why that's yeah. why it's a gremlin, not my mind elf. Or my, my, I have one of those too, but the mind elf just yells at me to pick my shit up off the floor. <laughs> Did you have, uh, you had another part to your question. Yeah, yeah. Um, essentially, like, what's the uh what's the social experience like in med school and that could be answered by anyone i was thinking about it you know as an older person like is it easy to connect with people and that sort of thing it's funny uh i think sarah um might be the least able to answer this question in the (laughs) sense that she started during the pan oh no you yeah you started during the pandemic Okay. And so there wasn't a lot of there wasn't a ton of social well, life well, but during that first semester. But I don't know. I do. Despite starting in the pandemic, I feel like I've been able to connect with people in med school in a way that I haven't my whole life. Like, I feel like even though I'm 34, 34 <laughs> it's already um, so proud, so proud, Sarah. I, I don't know. I feel like I feel like it's been it's been a life changing experience in that I've, I've grown so much and been able to connect with people. Like it's through those, those connections through getting involved with um, student orgs that, that, that I, that I've been interested in and just meeting people that have like similar, um, similar interests or yeah, it's, there's, there's definitely a lot of opportunity for, for socialization Um that but it's not it's not like undergrad like it's not all like going out late and like drinking and partying and stuff um there's yeah there is a little bit of that if that's what you're into and you can do that too oh yeah black light party is coming up. <laughs> yeah yeah black and that's fun party. and saying that too like if that's something that you want to want to do like I feel like I would be perfectly welcome at that black light party that's coming up like mm-hmm. there I I've chatted to people about it. Like if I can get away from my children, I'm going to try and go like, (laughs) so it's, yeah, it's, I, I don't feel like as an older student, like I'm, um, like I'm not included in any way at all. I actually feel kind of the opposite. So yeah. Medical school very much has the same vibe to me as if you've ever been on a sports team, especially like a club sports team or something, somewhere that's practicing a lot and they're putting you through like a lot of drills and stuff. There's a, concept of this like shared hardship that creates an instant bond like that's sometimes the reason that cited why sports like people on the same sports team will become so close um it's because it's like we've all been through the same drills we all had to get up at four this morning to come to the pool or to the gym or whatever and do all the work um and medical school is the same way like we all had to sit through the 8 a.m lectures we've all felt really overwhelmed by the test schedule and there's there's a solidarity in that where you're talking to the only other people that can understand I was going to say the interesting thing about med school that um, maybe a lot of undergrads might not have fully appreciated is that everybody is pretty much doing the same thing in lockstep. Mm -hmm. Um, So unlike in undergrad, you know, you don't go to, you know, you don't pick some classes and go to those classes. Um, Everybody's doing pretty much the same thing during that first couple of years with maybe an elective or two thrown in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely a shared experience there that you, you might not have um other you might you might not uh, think about yeah and you learn to rely on each other in that way mm-hmm. where it's like when you're struggling because everyone else is doing the same stuff you are they are the people that you reach out to and being like hey you want to complain about having to do this stupid assignment when we're studying for an exam and they're like oh my gosh yes i do and that was how i made all my based friends on <laughs> complaining are very very deep that's been my experience <laughs> very yes. strong very strong <laughs> studies on so this strong. What's the glue between just those <laughs> those friendships of yeah. complaining shared misery yeah. hell yeah um what do you think brenna did we answer your question did we answer your question even slightly yeah even tangentially yes. No, you you all respond on yeah. I appreciate it. Hell yeah. Um, what's your timeline? <laughs> do you think? 
I'm going to apply next spring slash summer. Mm -hmm. Congrats. Right. Exciting cool. time. Well, if your application uh, path takes you to the Carver College of Medicine, uh, I hope you'll stop by my office. I'm right near where all the interviews take place, which I'm really loving this week mm -hmm. because I'm seeing a lot of uh, people go by my office. Didn't, didn't get that last year, so <laughs> kind of cool. In suits, sweating. Like yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank, you for, uh, thank you for calling us, Brenna. Thanks yeah. so much. Best yeah. of luck yeah. with everything. We'll, we'll, yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. All Bye. right. Have Bye. A good one. Bye. Oh, look at us. I wasn't sure what she could see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the camera changes based on. I move it around all the time. I'm always. Oh, yeah. Why is it up the there zoom? now? I'm always messing with it. I was Does wondering, Dave, if I if I blend into the new chairs. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a green screen, but all strange. they see is your head and your jeans. They're like, what's in between? <laughs> Je Jenna Marbles vibes. We're just <laughs> painting myself into my green screen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so glad people got that. Yeah. Whatever Good happened job. to her? She stopped making videos. It was just too hard on her mental health. And judging... <sighs> She and Julian are engaged. They got engaged. They a few are. Months ago. I know. Wow. I'm so happy. Wow, that's awesome. They cool. look so. They look so happy. I'm so happy for her. I thought I didn't realize she was gay. I thought she was straight. No, Julian. Julian. Oh, I thought you said Jillian, and I was like, no, Julian. Oh, good for her. No, she <laughs> she is straight, but she. Oh. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, cool. But we love her like she's not. So <laughs> <laughs> she is an ally. Yeah. She is an ally. Community. Yeah. Hey, I forgot she, to mention she's the top straight, of the She's straight, but Kermit's, Kermit's K as hell. <laughs> who, are we, who are we talking about? I, feel like I was going to say, so she, she's, she's an YouTuber, internet uh, yeah. celebrity. Uh, she's like an OG. OG YouTuber. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. OG. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Come on, Sarah. Just, just well, go hang on. Google Jenna Marbles. She's not from this country, so she gets a lot of passes here. Come on, don't tell me I that can, nobody watches Jenna Marbles in I Australia. I, I she had like do they? 10 million subscribers. I, didn't, at the height of I her don't popularity. know. I don't think I heard of YouTube till I got here. Wow. <laughs> is that true? Which is weird. I've they, been here 10 that years. That is an alternate reality. Thought, that's weird because I thought they did like YouTube events in Australia. I could have I didn't oh, live I moved my from one Australia of my when I was 13, though. Huh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, maybe. And I'm old. So that was 20 <laughs> years ago. Okay. Fair um, yeah. And then I've been here 10 years. So. Okay. That's how old YouTube? Uh, 2005 is when it oh, is when it so, launched. Okay, about, so maybe yeah. I could have YouTubed in the yeah. UK. Yeah, I don't really remember back that far. Yeah, yeah. like it launched then and then took off around 2000. I spent way too much time on this goddamn website. Um, I mean, it was <laughs> it was TV on the internet. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. I completely forgot we're doing a podcast. It is what still are we amazing. Talking about? My my favorite uh, one of my favorite YouTube channels is uh, How Ridiculous, which is from. Australia, yeah, and uh, they drop things from towers and <laughs> and uh, do all kinds of weird competitions between each other, and it's a lot of fun. And <laughs> it's definitely not super intellectual, which is what I want when I get home from work. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be intellectual. <laughs> I get uh, to watch Cookie C, kids uh, opening toys. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, the kids yeah. opening yes. toys. Yes. Oh, my God. Those kids that, make bank. That creeps me out. Yeah. I miss <laughs> all of that, and I'm happy I did. Yeah. Kids love looking at kids playing with toys more than they like playing with it's toys. It's sad. Nothing against I, your kids. Just yeah. Like, no, yeah. I just, it's real, though. Yeah. It's real. Yeah. 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 Usually, I would say this at the beginning of the show, and I forgot to say it, so I'm going to say it now so that we can put it at the beginning of the show later. Oh, smart. Uh, today's episode is sponsored by Enso Rings, uh, but we'll talk about them later on in the show. Like right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what's, you, keep you know, it the way I want to talk. What? You should keep it the way it is. <laughs> I want to talk about our uh, our sponsor this week, Enso Rings. Uh, occasionally when you wear metal rings like me, you have to take them off, which I guess isn't, uh, you know, it isn't a problem until the day you lose your wedding ring because you forgot to put it back on like my wife did. <clears throat> Actually, I don't know if she took it off and forgot to put it back on. She just lost it. Um, I, I know feel like we're getting deep into Dave's marital life, and I don't. <laughs> yeah, this just turned into therapy. Yeah, so tell us more, hey, look, Dave. How I'm did that just, make you feel? I'm just bringing up a, a problem with. <laughs> just, my I don't know just, how that happened. My yeah. mic just punished me. My mic just said, <laughs> "Shut up, <laughs> stop talking." It happens to all of us, Miranda. Oh, don't goodness worry. gracious. Um. Yeah, so I know people who are um, involved in procedures or surgery often hang their rings around their necks on a chain, right? 
Um, but oh. I think that's kind of annoying too. Why have a ring if you can't wear it? Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I've been loving the Rise collection from Enso Rings. These beautiful silicone rings are a fantastic replacement for metal. A fantastic replacement for metal rings. Uh, they combine um, the timeless design of hard metal rings with the flexibility of silicone. Mm -hmm. Enso Rings Rise collection is engineered with anti ring avulsion technology. Go ahead and look up ring avulsion on Google Not while going I keep to. talking. <laughs> Not going um, to. On it. It's gross. Uh, they oh. are infused with SteriTouch antimicrobial technology for a cleaner ring, so you can feel good about keeping your ring on throughout the day, whether you're at work, exercising, or operating the 7 Tesla MRI machine. Is that something you guys will be doing, I think? You guys will be pushing the buttons on the MRI machine. Why would you tell us to look that up? You're a monster. <laughs> I know. We had, Give like, me a flash. Give don't me... tell us to no. Google this. This is how we descended into chaos that one session. <laughs> like, can't just do it's, that. It's degloving. Yeah, it's, it's degloving. Degloving injuries. Also, oh. I think radiology techs do it, but doctors are in the room for it. Yeah. So you, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so rings work under PPE. Perfect for med students, doctors, nurses, and anyone who needs to wear gloves at work. The sleek design comes in colors like obsidian, slate, pink sand, turquoise. And if that's not your style... And so Rings offers lots of other interesting collections uh, in a variety of incredible metallic and pearlescent colors. Um, so I, you know, I, I, one of the questions we had that you had asked Miranda uh, in a past episode is, is uh, whether they could be autoclaved. And when I asked the folks at <laughs> Enso Rings about that, they assured me that heat and pressure are not a problem for these babies. Okay. Um, and I wanted to point, you know, my fingers have changed a couple of times over the years. It's nice knowing that a flexible ring is uh, a little bit more adaptable when your body changes. What are you doing with the yeah. ring that you need to autoclave it? No. Huh? What are you What are you doing with your ring that you need to autoclave it? Hey, I don't know. I was. I curious. wasn't gonna. I'll I wasn't gonna much. ask personal questions. <laughs> of, I don't know. We're not I used judging, to work in a micro lab, so that probably would have been it. <laughs> like, yeah. Gloves? Like the, every now and again, we yeah. wear gloves all the time. Hey, yeah, we're, yeah, not, we're not like judging. But sometimes <laughs> you just you gotta spike some cell culture and you just don't want to fucking bother. <laughs> <laughs> like if the E. coli gets on my rig, I want to know I get stuck in the autoclave and it'll be fine. <laughs> isn't it antimicrobial anyways though? So you probably did, that, is, did you say that Dave? The, 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 this particular collection, yeah. The Rise collection oh. is uh, has antimicrobial uh, stuff in it. Stuff. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, my wife and I have picked out some in the unicorn color because, she, uh, as I Aww. said, she lost uh, her ring. And so I think we're going to maybe, 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 maybe we'll do that. I think we probably will. Uh, best of all, yeah. they've really nailed the pricing on these. They're very affordable. Uh, they still look great. Um, and if that's not enough, I have a special offer uh -oh. for short coats. 10% off your first purchase. So go to EnsoRings.com today and use the promo code SHORT. That's promo code SHORT at E-N-S-O rings.com. Thank you for, for your support, Enso Rings. Love it. I was thinking, too, then you could buy, like, a summer ring and a winter ring. Yeah. Oh. You have all the rings. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. a, and a pregnant ring. And a pregnant ring. Anyone ring. having babies? You can <laughs> pregnant ring. For every, no, every time you're... A fair ring. I don't know. I feel, like my, I feel like my hands just keep on changing a sizes. A hangover ring. Yeah. <laughs> a drunk ring. <laughs> if you like Star Wars, they have a Star Wars collection. So pretty cool. Well, these are really nice, actually. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Um, you guys, I've been noticing something. Star Wars. I've been noticing something oh. that I wanted to point out to you. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh oh. There aren't enough woolly mammoths. No, there are not. On the tundra. I was just really thinking true. that. Yeah. Yep. These days. Am I right? Oh, uh, absolutely. A uh, startup called Colossal has announced their intention to bring the woolly mammoth back from the dead by 2027 using CRISPR. It's like it's like, of course it's they like, have. like what was the what was the reason to even make Jurassic Park? Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. a cautionary tale, guys. Yeah. I'm just trying to imagine the the startup going to the finance bros out in New York yeah. saying, I want millions of dollars. Wait, now, wait a minute. And we, laying this out. See, like, we have talked. We talked about this recently on the show in the sense that I have all these ideas that seem very, very stupid. And then. Hey, don't, it don't often, put yourself down. Dude. Hey, look, I, they seem very stupid to me. And then, you know, maybe a few years after I had that idea, somebody comes out and tries to commercialize <laughs> this idea and maybe makes a bunch of money off of it. Well, like, what so, you know, like it's, it, the point is like yeah. the point is not to think this idea is stupid. Nobody will ever go for it. The point is to actually think of a stupid idea and then somebody out there. Are, are, are you kidding? The tech bros will eat this shit up. I, I bet they're, they're the ones who I came bet. up with Soylent. 
They haven't, <laughs> they haven't slept in days. <laughs> they're running on zero yes. sleep. Yeah, they're, they don't even know what's real or not. They're running on caffeine patches. Psychedelics and are hope. coming into the the West Coast. Psychedelics are running the they're woolly mammoth. Funneling monster <laughs> energy drinks into their yeah. anuses just to stay up. <laughs> Just fueled by psilocybin. I feel I I strongly believe in that. This is an idea. I don't think anyone heard what she said. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one that got I did, to I did that. hear it. That's yeah. where my judgmental eyes are going now. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, oh actually, God. what they really want to do is use the mammoth genes to create cold adapted uh, hybrid element uh, elephants. It doesn't really make it better. Traits would include smaller ears and more body fat. Uh, Co-founders include our old friend George Church, Harvard Medical School's wacky professor who helped develop DNA sequencing. He's been the driving force behind the development or a driving force behind the development of CRISPR as a technology. He did uh, make a eugenics dating app to help connect genetically compatible people and he's known for subsisting for months on nutrient broths used for keeping cells alive in the lab. So Oh my god! I think the tech bros will be oh, right on his shit. Th- 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 that was okay. ur- that used to be an urban legend. Um, when I was speaking in of the eugenics app, there is a show about this theory of like the fact that the show's premise is that they have created the technology in which you can be matched with your perfect love, mm. and the show documents the people's experience of being in a marriage and thinking, "Oh, should I like figure it out?" Like you have one perfect match, and the DNA will take you to your perfect match. Do you do it? Is this a real? Fuck thing? no. Or no, but that's okay. funny because the reason I heard about it was on a podcast in which the girl was explaining the show, and the other podcast host thought it was real, and it was very funny to have to listen to this like whole revelation of like this is not a real <laughs> oh premise. Oh my gosh! Oh my god! Eugenics dating app just raises like. The amount of red flags it raises in my head is astronomical. Yeah. Like my whole I mean, brain is covered in red carpeting right now from the amount yeah, of flags. For what genes are they matching on? Like, well, yeah. that's, that's, how do they decide? That's like what three of those red I, flags is I that question exactly. Yeah. I haven't actually tried it because I figured that if I inputted my profile into the eugenics dating app, it would be like, eh, sorry, you're not. <laughs> well, I mean, no matches. <laughs> my main complaint with that, which is perhaps secondary to the elephants thing this is also a concern i have with the woolly mammoths to get back to the main story but my concern with the dating app is just that's an ethical nightmare yeah that's yeah. terrible yeah. to follow up on the ethical nightmare if you want to see how this might play out uh Uh-oh. the one on netflix not sponsored yes but it's only got a 41 percent on rotten tomatoes wow. use yeah. that information how you I will i think i watched it it was kind of cool was yeah. It? yeah it was entertaining yeah and seems like disturbing but yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be once again I th- I think this idea suffers from uh, no, some okay. amount of like, do we need this? Is this what we yeah, need? Yeah, that was going to be my yeah, question like, is that I kind of understand like, okay, woolly mammoths are basically just a cold adapted elephant with hair. Like, fuck, go for it. But why? Yeah, what's the point? Like, I, I do actual science and I have to like bend over backwards trying to tell the NIH why studying cart channels would be important. Hey, man. Why do they get to just make a woolly mammoth and be like, I don't know. Figure it out. It's like, they, mm. Yeah. They, well, all they have to do is go to investors who are willing to pony up millions of dollars to see woolly mammoths. And you know that there are people out there who are. That's true. Gonna, the same, if yeah. People who have millions of dollars who are like, yeah, fuck yeah. I want to see some woolly mammoths. But it's like, cause when you say, cause really it's not a woolly mammoth. It's a, a de- it's an elephant with hair. Yeah. Well, like I, I think that that's cheating. You know, like if you're going to say bring back a woolly mammoth, I'm like, OK, make me a woolly mammoth. But if you bring me an elephant with fur, I'm like, that's not a woolly mammoth. That's an elephant with hair. It's an elephant with it's an elephant with a mohawk. <laughs> you just stuck shag carpet on. Yeah. On the bar and then said we made it. How um how how much is this happening in the world like now with with people using this technology to modify animals because i feel I like i've seen seen it happening in like dogs like dog breeders and stuff like i oh. I, f- I feel like i saw a documentary mm. kind of recently where people were actually able to purchase kits online and like you didn't this guy didn't even have a, a a lab he just he was a dog breeder and he was modifying the dna of these dogs I think I, I think I know what you're talking about is this the guy that like he basically has it set up in his garage but it is like a full lab and everything i feel like i've seen something like that 
Yeah, is I'm, that I'm looking at there's a there's a dog breeder named David Ishi, um, who is biohacking uh, breed purebred pure breeds. It used to be called animal husbandry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which um, he great his, term. It, it, this headline. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this headline says he's uh, working to spare pure purebreds from debilitating disorders. Oh well, that oh, sounds see, nice. See, that's nice. That's a that's a good goal for CRISPR. Let the pugs breathe. Damn it! Yeah. What I, thought was interesting I think the problem that, with pugs he... is that once you uh, once you breed them so that they can breathe, they're no longer pugs. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They're no like, longer smushy yeah. face, which is the essence of why you want. But that's a smushy the point. Face dog. We shouldn't yeah. have smushy face dogs if they suffocate and die on Agreed. their own. Noses. So what he's trying to breed them back into their normal, like naturally selected yeah. form that I they were before be we happy, tried to breed There must in. be a happy medium somewhere because like pit bulls don't have as long as snout as wolves do but they don't have those kinds of breathing like there's a happy medium somewhere yeah. where it's like okay you have well, you now have enough breathing room that you're not like choking on your own tissue we'll yeah. have to ask our friend dr george church about it. yeah a little friend it. is going a little too far <laughs> <laughs> hey man, he's from harvard you know you know harvard's like you know the, the people at harvard are like sitting this in their fuck. sitting in their office going oh fuck here he goes again <laughs> Why did you yeah. let him in? Did yeah. somebody give George a microphone again? I know this is not relevant to the Wooly Mammoth story even slightly, but can we circle back to the drinking cell media? Because that's something I've always wondered if would be possible. I would. But I have fantasized yeah. over the years about doing a taste test of cell media on mm. the show. Because you would think it would be sweet because it's high glucose. But Aline's, Aline is appropriately looking at me. As, as someone who a- uses media a lot. It's disgusting even before you grow stuff in it. Yeah. But technically, I but guess it's you like, could. It's pink. It's like you could fool yourself into thinking it's Kool Aid. What, wait, uh, what wait, do you what imagine it would taste pink? like? He- I'm, I'm thinking me, like hex cell media, all, like mammalian oh, cell media. I thought you tried LB like media. LB broth. LB okay. media would be disgusting, but like hex yeah. cell media. I, I Tell me, I come on. You okay. have tasted it. No. Um, why, I mean, why the hell would if I, I was, that? I can't you even know, drink my own water bottle in my lab. You think exactly. I'm going to start drinking media? <laughs> like, I can't <laughs> even have a coffee in there. <laughs> you know, I can't say with certainty that one time if I was pouring one bottle out into another, a drop didn't fall on my face kind of close to my mouth. Uh-huh. That's as close as it came. Okay. And it was enough. Okay. Yeah. But what were you? Are you talking about cell culture media or bacterial? Like, Ooh, yeah, that's a different those story. Are very different. Yeah, those are <laughs> those two are different, different I, things. I, I wasn't aware of uh, of the difference. So. <laughs> okay, yeah. you've educated me. Write you've, in you've and tell down, Dave the difference. <laughs> you've narrowed down they, the field of possible yeah. taste testing for me. I assume yeah. mammalian cell. Yeah, uh, that would be be the bacteria one has a very distinct smell. I don't know if it's just me, but like I was pregnant walking in. A micro lab and micro labs are very smelly. They have like, oh, yeah, all sorts yeah. of varieties of smell. But for some reason, the the even just like the sterile culture media was the one thing that just like I couldn't go near well, it because it has a, yeast in it. Yeah, it's yeah. Sm- yeast extract. Oh, it's, that's the yeast what it extra- is. Because, I mean, depending on the yeah, yeast medium, extract, but, but nothing like Vegemite. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> like, let, me, let me pitch this to you. It's always smelled to me like a combination of peanut butter and dog food. Yeah, dog food. Uh, that's a good. Yeah, yeah like mm-hmm. that's because like I've had. I, it depends on the brand. The one I had in undergrad smelled a lot more like peanut butter, and the one that I have now smells a lot more like dog food. But it's always been somewhere in that range. Is the bacterial media, yeah. the cell yeah. media doesn't actually have a smell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, I don't know how I would even get. I suppose I could go over to biomedical stores and. Uh, it would not be hard to get your hands on cell media. Some, Literally, I, just walk up and. But be like, I also, I don't like this, please. but I also am fearful of being accused of trying to kill medical students. Or yes, you like absolutely would. I mean, yes, yes, that's yes. like not a sign of thing, like a waiver. I don't know. <laughs> Informed consent yeah. is a thing. Hey, don't hey, uh, Dean lawyers. Cooper, I got a waiver. <laughs> <laughs> don't look too closely at it. Just that's for, for sure. You know, yeah. guys over here, just, just like just hand this them the form like this. Just be like, yeah, just sign it. Sign it. Yep. 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 Go for it. Go for it. I wanted to ask you about this hospital in Texas that's dealing with a nursing shortage uh, by asking med students to step up and volunteer to help out. Mm. A University of Texas Southwestern sent a message to its med students telling them about this incredible opportunity, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, to do things like, quote, second assist in (laughs) procedures, helping patients with daily activities, checking vitals, and, um, and many other things. Um. It, yeah. Yeah, uh, so yeah. most of the comments I read on Reddit where the message was posted by a disgruntled student on the fuck work so much subreddit were negative. Yep. Oh, I thought you were talking about anti-work. Yeah. I was, I was thinking so it was much. anti-work. Yeah. 
Um, <laughs> anti work squared. <laughs> <laughs> Next level. People were. People, this, people this seemed also... concerned about using medical students to work without pay when the solution might be to actually pay nurses more. Yeah. Exactly. This would yeah. also fit really well on um, r slash a boring dystopia, which is yeah. one of my both favorite and least favorite subreddits for how much it makes me depressed. Oh. It's a little too real sometimes. Oh, I mean, basically, very. they're like, hey, <laughs> have you ever wanted to be a slave? Well, here's your chance. <laughs> Benefits, none. I Bragging mean, well, look, rights, tons. Well, look, I mean, medical students volunteer to do all kinds of things. Yeah, but volunteer. Yeah. Like, of their own volition. They're not being I presented. Know, nobody, nobody well, was, yeah, in fairness, this no This is a volunteer situation. And no. I say this because as much as, like, I hated myself for this being my first thought, but when I read the initial email, because it's pretty positive, it's like, oh, yeah, we'll provide training and we'll make sure you're not uncomfortable. It's like, in my head, I'm like, if I got this email, I would probably sign up, like, to take on extra work. Yeah. Like, marketing th- matters. Marketing yeah. matters. Now, granted, I am also in a weird situation where I haven't been back to clinic in a while. So part of me is like, I would just kind of want to go and make sure that I still know how to do stuff. And it's not yeah. taking time away from, like, my stuff I'm actually doing. But at the same time, it's like, it is very, very transparently like, hey, we have a nursing shortage. So we need extra hands. We don't have to pay you. Like. Yeah, I think there's a huge problem to acknowledge, too, which is to say that, like, medical students are on the same level as nurses. Yeah, that's the main problem. My best friends are nurses, and I would never believe that I could do their job. Mm -hmm. I'm not trained for their job. They're better at their job, and they know more than me at this current time. And that is, like, that's the truth. Yeah. And so to assume that medical students, just because they're in medicine— have the ability to go be nurses, that's... that's, well, that's I, I don't that's know that... Arrogance. To be fair, I don't know that that was... I mean, yes, they listed okay. some things well, that they might do, but but it's read to me more... And I'm not an expert in nursing, but it read to me more like sort of like the nursing assistant kind of category rather than Even nurse. so, because here's... Still, the, and here's yeah. the thing. As I thought about this a little bit more, um, the point... Because medical students, let's be honest, are sometimes overworked to ethically questionable standards but the whole point of medical students is that they're not actually that helpful in clinic like they don't actually really do anything they are there to learn if anything they are a burden the reason that academic medical centers put up with them is because they will eventually go on to become doctors and that's part of the contract of the people that work there when you're when you're pitching this as it would be one thing if it's like hey volunteer to learn nursing skills that would be one thing but the fact that it's like we're compensating for a nursing shortage yeah. by sticking with medical students that's not actually going to help if anything that's going to put more burden on the nurses because then they have to train these idiots who don't great know what they're point. doing it's going to kill people point. Yeah. yeah so it's like it would be because people assume and i've actually run into people with this assumption that like doctors are like a step above nurses like they know everything the nurses know and more not even slightly no. true. I, I dare you to go find yeah. your doctor and ask your doctor to put your IV in. And they're, they're <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> you will yeah. bleed to death. Like, doctors don't <laughs> Minus know this an shit. anesthesiologist, you should, should probably okay, not fair ask enough, yeah. your doctor to sure. put an IV in. Yeah, just yeah. don't do it. <laughs> I think that's the arrogance of the request is this yeah. assumption that, like, you can sub med students in for this like a literal class of a profession like yeah. nursing is a profession people go to school to learn how to do it properly and for them to be like yeah yeah you know what blood is you know what blood is yeah come on <laughs> in and do the job i yeah I, when you said it i was like that's that's what's so wrong about this is that they're like we don't need you <laughs> you there come come jab yeah. this person with and a it's needle just back to the essence of like let's value our healthcare workers yeah let's value them and let's put our money behind it like yeah I don't know if this is really true but I would almost bet that there's a lot of doctors that would be willing to take even a smidgen of a pay cut to raise the salary for nurses yeah again yeah that's coming from a person who doesn't have a salary right now <laughs> but, <laughs> but I like well, you to know believe know what happens you know what happens when you start making money you become conservative and you start saying well this is mine I earned it and, fiscally yeah. conservative sure. and yeah, socially yeah. liberal that yeah. whole thing no I, I think I put myself up on my bootstraps and also a not insignificant amount of my parents money <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just let's value our healthcare workers that are yeah. in there on the front lines doing what they're doing every day yeah. that genuinely not many people can do. And let's yeah. put it put our money where our mouth is. Like there's the money. There is the money. Yeah. yeah. In the pool of healthcare. Someone in this allocate it correctly. Someone in this Reddit thread, and I'm so glad you brought this up because someone in the Reddit thread pointed out that when 
like, uh, and again, I'm just quoting some random post I'm half remembering from Reddit. So please, if there are nurses, feel free to write to the at gmail.com people, I, and roast me. I don't know why people still think we have to disclaim our uh, our, th- our random, uh, not well thought out ideas. But it's important ahead. to me. Okay. But this person was basically saying, you know, when you go in to interview for a nursing job, they kind of treat it like you are. Like they treat it like, oh, you're being so generous and kind and here we'll throw you a check as a sound. Like almost like they're expecting you to work for this out of just the generosity of your own heart and just oh. I'll take the payment oh, yeah. if I must. So like being essentially they expect all nurses to be saints. And they yeah. are, but they also have this is their job. Like Yeah, they, they need to pay the fa- bills. They need to have yeah, a living they should wage. Be fairly they need compensated. to be compensated for the yeah. extreme yeah. amount of Nurses put that up with a with lot. so much shit, a literal lot. and figurative shit. Yeah, yeah. So, if I if I hate seeing my patient twice a day because I'm rounding and then checking in in the afternoon, nurses are doing that times a million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Plus, All they get to listen to day. you know the the people bringing that ring in their buzzer because they drop something and all. Yeah. And there's an there's a reflection in this of like during the pandemic when all those like our healthcare workers are heroes type thing and it's like I ne- hi I never actually volunteered to be a martyr you did that for me yeah. like you are forcing me into this and that's the way I see nurses where it's like why are you asking for more money this is what you this is your calling and it's like you said that well, yeah. I want to feed my family and, and again yeah. it comes back to like why is there a nursing shortage you know it's mm-hmm. because of money yes but it's also because um just like in many other sectors right now lots of people don't really want to do their shit work anymore um yeah. they sh- go back to their shit jobs uh because they weren't treated well yeah i mean there's also a working condition side of it so Ooh, excuse me fix those things and then you can ask med students to do the jobs of nurses i think that's <laughs> it's like it's i mean the the essence of the problem is like unhealthy like toxic like workplace culture yeah Yeah. and they just made it worse by like demeaning the group of people that they're showing a lack of respect for by replacing them with a group of people they have even less respect (laughs) (laughs) yeah like i I, there's too much sugar in this pour more sugar (laughs) like that helps yeah Yeah. i i am genuinely curious kind of what are the if anyone knows and this might just be an open-ended question to discuss at a later time but what are the like best case solutions for the nursing shortage and not just like pay them more, but like what is like a genuine solution to bettering their working environment? Because at the end of the day, patients will be patients and bad people will be bad people. And there will still be crappy parts of that, that job figuratively and literally crappy. So like, I I don't know quite the answer to this, but I'm curious if people have proposed solutions. Yeah. Well, I wonder if part of it is because nurses end up having to work very long, busy shifts. And I realize that hire more nurses is perhaps not the most effective way to counteract a nursing shortage because I'm kind of doing circular reasoning there. But like part of me thinks that if you just hired more people to cover more stuff and didn't have to constantly because part of the reason why people get burned out of professions is because they're constantly busy and they're constantly trying to play catch up. So if you just like got people to help cover some of that responsibility or heck even maybe like shifted it onto other parts of the profession like maybe hire more PAs or more MAs to do some of that more busy work then you wouldn't nec- then you wouldn't get people being so burned out and you could also give them shorter shifts as well so that they can actually go home and sleep and have yeah. fun yeah and i think the key to what you're saying though is hire people on don't try and persuade medical students <laughs> 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 they're doing to to do that mm-hmm. so, yeah yeah, I don't know. Um, oh, also, I mean, respect goes a long way yeah. as well. well I mean, That's the we, thing; it's the t- hierarchy is like that. It, you need to break down that that hierarchy that there is between the between the doctors, the nurses, the patients, the med students. Like, the, we're all just humans. We're yeah. all just people. Um, how do you do that? I don't know. Yeah, we. I mean, we we talked a few weeks ago about. Um, about the uh, the labor crisis that exists now, and and you know, I was of the opinion that yeah. um, a lot of it was about um, most people. Most people don't feel like they are engaged in their work. They don't feel like they are uh, partners in success. They feel more like cogs. Mm-hmm. Um, and I assume that's as prevalent among nurses as it is among other groups. Um, and so. Figuring out a way to uh, figuring out a way for leaders, leaders figuring out a way to help the people they lead 
be more invested in their work and enjoy it more because they are contributing to the success of the organization and aren't just, you know, cogs. Yeah, a piece I think of is, equipment. is probably, probably yeah, a probably big deal. Pretty easy. Like, just like listen to them, talk yeah. to them. Yeah. That's part of respect is like give them a voice and then listen when they say things. Listen yeah. when they say things. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And um, not we'll have a meeting about it. Like actually listen. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, again, if I ran the world, things would be different. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always hard to, hard to tell if these stories are real or if they're just a small number of incidents. But apparently people are now drinking betadine to <laughs> ward off COVID. Uh, well, that's not a thing people we should do. Oh, guys, one. come on. <laughs> You're killing of, us out here. Because of course they are. I, I'm i glad you brought this up because I want to talk about a thing. Because the ivermectin thing has been going around. And it's very funny. I want to say right now that it is. I find it very funny. Yeah. Uh, because it's a anti-parasitic and it would do not have the virus. It is for people. It has been used in people, but different dosages and different formulation. Not the stuff that you get at the feed store. Not the stuff you get at the feed store. All right. Quit slapping someone figuratively. So, so what's your, what's your, my uh, thing is I wonder if like even people acknowledging it is worsening the problem because Mm -hmm. the way I saw the ivermectin and honestly, it kind of worked the same way with like hydroxychloroquine and like, can bleach thing although that was the president partly so um <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do he said it um is it it gets worse when news media picks up on it and starts spreading it and starts telling people not to do it because as soon as you some you, you get someone who's conspiratorially minded who thinks that a lot of this is being like blown out of proportion or being used as some kind of like social thing or it's being used to hide an ulterior motive as soon as as you get people from that system telling you not to do it or that you're being silly for doing it, they start going, ah, they must be hiding something. I'm on to something. Yeah. yeah, Because like, why is it such a big deal if now they're coming out and saying not to do it? Like why, how did this become a big deal? And then they start doing massive air quotes research. And then they start thinking, ah, they're like, if they're making a big deal out of it, there must be something there that they don't want to. And I'm not saying everyone who does this is conspiratorially minded, but I think that's sort of the flow. I see what you're saying. My, mm-hmm. my, my thought on this and my thought on this was if you report something and if you report something and, and say simply, you know, people are drinking betadine to ward off COVID, um, then yeah, that's a, that's irresponsible reporting. But if you include in your report, you know, people are drinking betadine to ward off COVID and many doc and, and doctors are saying this is a terrible idea and you shouldn't do it and will hurt you. And, you know, you'll throw up and you'll, you know, have bloody diarrhea and all this kind of stuff because yeah, betadine delicious. kills, kills uh, cells and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. If somebody goes ahead and does it anyway, because they went to the internet and did some internet research and, and uh, that convinces them that, oh, the doctors are wrong. I don't think any additional harm has been. I'm not sure that any additional harm has been done in that situation because they were going to do it anyway. Well, were they, though? Because yeah. the point is that you're coming at this from people that fundamentally don't trust doctors, don't trust like the medical community in and general. The media. No. And the media. They absolutely yeah. don't trust the media. So like if the media tells them not to do something, they're going to start looking for reasons to do it. I think my thing is that, and I I don't want to say that like the doctors in the situation or even the media bears any responsibility for this. I just think well, that you know, if the media comes to a doctor and says, "Hey, should people drink betadine?" They're not going to say, "No comment." But I, I think mean- the, I think the media sh- I think the media should find a new headline. I just don't think yeah. they should acknowledge it because like that's that like these things as far in my limited time as an internet citizen, I find that these things run out of steam pretty quickly. But media reporting when, gives after them they more all died. fuel. So where are people... <laughs> after everybody who ate a Tide Pod I, Not died. even that. It's just that they, people lose interest if yeah. it isn't being spread around. If it, Like, people aren't going to say, oh, I did it and it was effective and it became this... Like, because it's not going to. If the media doesn't report... The, if the media doesn't give them something to distrust, they're not going to care. But people will still talk about it on social media. So where, where are people going to get their valid information from yeah. when if they don't go to because not everyone goes to their doctor to talk about it yeah so it's i you think would, I, I think yeah i mean it's the the assumption is that if 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 we don't 
if we don't talk about it on the news, then they will find out that it's bad some other way. Mm -hmm. But will they? Yeah, I think they're still going to hear about it, even if it's not in like the mainstream media. People are still going to hear. I I get what you're saying. Yeah, I do get I what just, you're saying. It like it makes like it into this big, it, big, I mean, big what, deal. What like, what we're all talking about is how do we counteract people's total lack of critical thinking skills? Yeah, like there's a reason that we train children to have critical thinking skills because it's compatible with life. And when when people are drinking bleach. They're too far gone. There's how do you even that, reason yeah. with that? I was going to say, like, and like what percentage of people are that far gone? Do we maybe we just need to maybe they'd be on help. <laughs> like, yeah, like as, 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 as sad as it is, I personally and again, this is my own opinion. I personally think that that is the case where it's like if they're if they're going to be convinced by someone spreading a social media post alone, then like, I don't know what to do for you, man. That's just yeah. not something I'm going to talk you out of. But when you start. And again, I'm not even saying that you should never report on stuff like this, but there has to be a way to do it because when you start giving it to like the news media and people that because people may think, all right, this beta thing is stupid, but you get those people that already have a distrust of the media. Yeah. And now it's like they're not distrusting, like they're not believing the beta thing or the ivermectin thing. They're just distrusting the person that's telling them, if, yeah. if that makes sense. It's, it's like it's, it's, that these, it's a yeah. larger umbrella of people that will. Tr go for un like unproven medical treatments then we'll just like investigate something because they think they're being lied to by large media organizations it is but interesting think, that yeah. it's the same people that are doing this they're the same people that are the ones that don't want a vaccine because it doesn't have enough like actual research behind it, it doesn't have enough data behind it yes. yes they're the same ones that are saying well it's only been out a year so i just don't trust it yet yeah they're the same people yeah and they yet, so we're going to use an off-brand, like, not even an off-brand, like just a bad use of yeah. the thing. I mean, that I works. Like, this thing that's literally making my eyes water as I stand over it. And bleach? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. I'll just drink it. Yeah. Is yeah. it the that's, same people, that's... though? Do we know this? I was going to say, I facts? don't want to accidentally I didn't read the article. I, I should I didn't retract. read the article. No, but I appreciate how, that. How big of a problem is this? Did you? I, I don't think we know how big a problem this is. Okay. The, the uh, I mean, of course, it's, it, it, it's... It's the usual thing that happens when you, you hear something on the news is you, you know. It, you pull it off this, the news and then read it out to your gonna, podcast crew yeah, to, I mean, of course, <laughs> to get content. Uh, uh, of course, exactly. Of course, they're going to, um, of course, they're going to talk about it on the news. You know, nobody, the, the news doesn't routinely come on the air and say, hey, nothing happened today. Yeah. But um, nobody drank any betadine today. Uh, it's by, that's not it's by definition exceptional to yes. respond to yeah. your question I think in this particular case and I'm going back to the ivermectin thing purely because I think that is probably the more spread thing I do think that there is a significant overlap because those are the anti-government people basically if the government and by the government I am I guess I'm including the CDC even though it's technically a research organization but people don't seem to get that um yeah. it's got government funding whatever I don't doesn't everything have government it funding? It does. To some I have, yeah. For God's sake, I have government funding. You don't want so. government funding. <laughs> yeah. we, don't we, trust we Miranda. <laughs> She's in the pocket of big science. I, I just feel off my face. There's a robot underneath. She's like, I've been spying on you the whole time. But don't say that. People will believe you. Jesus. <laughs> don't give Careful. away our secret. Uh. But anyway, yeah, to respond to your question, in this particular case, I do think there's overlap because the thought process, I go down way too many of these rabbit holes, mm -hmm. you guys, not as an observer, not as a believer. No, nah, dude, we're here for it. Yeah. yeah. It, no, I the, get you. There's a thing of like, why is the government pushing this when there's like, like they'll start saying, oh, this is an effective treatment. So why are they pushing the vaccine so hard when there's like a treatment available? And then those people out of paranoia will then go and get the treatment sort of thing. Yeah. So I think in this particular case, I don't think everyone who believes in ivermectin or bleach or whatever is also anti-vax. Um, but I do think in this particular case, there's overlap just because people be like, well, I don't like, I don't trust that they're telling me all the information about the vaccine, but I, you know, it, I it think all, that it all maps to the same in, fundamental yeah, yeah. fear or, or like lapse in, in critical thinking. Yeah. Like, I think the fears are coming from the same source. Now, again, I don't want to straw man all of these people. Sure. So. I will say that, it was a little bit more understandable to me when there was no vaccine, when people were like, yeah. oh, I'm going to gargle some uh, hand sanitizer because, I mean, you know, yes, it's it's not good. It doesn't work. It's bad for you. Um, it's, you know, the same problem. But there was a lot of desperation, I think, back then. Yeah, there was definitely fueled by that. 
And I think that's where I drew that kind of conclusion, which is like if they're using this as prevention, I don't see a sane person being like, I already have the vaccine. Mm-hmm. I want extra pre- prevention. Like yeah. to me, that just doesn't it doesn't seem like that's the yeah. same mind. But then again, goes back to the are is is my mind the same mind as all these other people? And like at the end of the day, no. Yeah. I have how, how do we know my blue is the same as your blue? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's the paranoia that goes behind that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that makes there are sense. some studies that yeah. show diff- different antiseptics in vitro can destroy COVID in uh, in tissue cultures. Yeah, but those environments <laughs> are so reductive. Yeah. Like you're, you, also, you know, but, reminds- but betadine and 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 others yeah. cause significant cell death, and the data isn't really enough to make recommendations that it would. You know, this this reminds me of for my, COVID in situ. my absolute yeah. favorite. Well, top three XKCD comics has to do with this thing. Remember, every time you see a news article that says that a cancer treatment kills like 99 percent of cancer cells in a in cell culture. Also, just remember, so does a handgun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think about that a lot. Oh, well, uh, that's our show. We're ending it on that note. We're ending it on that note. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Let's talk about something a little more uplifting. Yeah, come on. Great flowers outside. It's beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Fall day. is starting. The weather is beautiful. Fall yeah. is my, I think my favorite season. Absolutely. Yeah. Spring is like two weeks in Iowa. Eh. I'll fight anyone that says the fall is not the best season. <laughs> spring is spring is great because you get that initial like oh winter's over hooray yeah. yeah. Um, and then you get two weeks of pleasant weather and then the gnats come out and it all goes to hell. I hate basket. the heat. I'm yeah. so, I'm so excited to not be sweaty and tired. But yeah, the fall, sun. you get to, you get to break out the, the, the pumpkin the blankets, spice latte. Yeah, the, yeah. the, the big, cu- the comfy the, sweaters. I have oh. a secret. I got a PSL the day they came out. <laughs> yeah. The day, August what, 25th. I'm not even a devotee. I don't even get Starbucks that often, but, but you should now you guys know my because, secret. Because pumpkin spice <laughs> is delicious. It's just it like is. cinnamon and nutmeg, and uh, like it's just delicious. It don't is. shame people for liking pumpkin spice things because it is delicious. Well, then right. I, I know Riley what I'm doing after. Had a PSL the day it happened, and I'm proud of it. I you think should you're, be. And, and I think you're basic. That is also true. Well, Dave, that is also because you are an agent of the patriarchy. Oh. So you know. Oh, fuck right. off. <laughs> Thanks, Miranda. Okay, we can end on that note. <laughs> That's our I love it. Thank you, Miranda, for giving me permission to end the show. Uh, Aline, Riley, Miranda, Sarah, thank you for uh, being on the show with me today. Thank you. Screw you, Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We hate you, Dave. And what kind of HSV1 outbreak would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, uh, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Our editors are AJ Chowdhury and Eric Bozart. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine, student government, and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Chemistry. I'm Dave Etler saying, don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Woo! Bye! <laughs> the double-handed wave.